I'm going to start off reading actually from Ephesians chapter 5, verses 31 through 33. We're going to talk a little bit about biblically healthy marriages. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 31. For this cause shall man leave his father and mother and shall be joined unto his wife. That word there meaning to be glued or to be adhered. And they too shall be one flesh. This is a great mystery. But I speak concerning Christ and the church. Nevertheless, let every one of you in particular so love his wife even as himself. And the wife see that she reverence her husband. Well, I was going to speak on this topic last week, but there was another needful topic for me to spend some time on. Uh, I began to work on this for a couple of reasons. One of the primary reasons was in my secular workplace, I was back... <laughs> I was back uh, assembling parts, and as I was working, there were a couple of ladies. They were assembling parts, probably about 20 feet away from me, uh, and they were having a discussion, primarily about their husbands and about marriage. And so as I worked, I didn't, I didn't dialogue with them, but I just listened. And uh, I began to think about how messed up the conversation really was and how incorrect many of their assessments were on their current marriages. And so I began to think a lot about this. Again, it, it is areas that we touch on throughout sermons, but I haven't dedicated an entire sermon to this topic in about a year. Uh, and it's interesting that I say that because I'll touch on that again later as we look at a poll. Most of us, or many of us here, are married. Uh, and if we're not, we're at least surrounded by those who are married. We know that marriage is a very common thing today, but unfortunately so is divorce. And many people, when they know those around them who get divorced, oftentimes it's not really even looked at with disdainment. And so for us as Christians, we really ought to be concerned about having biblically healthy marriages. There's a number of reasons why Christians need to have biblically healthy marriages uh, so that each of us as spouses are happy and content within the marriage. But we also need to have marriages where we can we can teach and train up our children and our grandchildren by showing them how it is that a faithful Christian is to live within the marriage bond. Now let me give you just two facts about marriage today. Uh, I looked up a lot of facts and a lot of polls. Majority of them I will not mention and I'll describe why here in a little bit. But let me give you these two. Due to, according to the study, jobs, children, TV, internet, hobbies, the home, and our family responsibilities, the average married couple spends four minutes a day alone together. Let that sink in for just a minute. Now, I was shocked when I first read that poll, but as I thought about it throughout the week, I think it's pretty close. On average, as spouses, we're certainly not spending enough time together. And I think the majority of us here get that. And so with that in mind, it is very understandable why many spouses feel unappreciated. It's understandable why many spouses feel unimportant to their spouse. And it's also understandable why many spouses feel detached from their spouse. How many of you have ever heard someone say they were falling out of love with their spouse? Kind of hard to feel that closeness and that intimacy within the marriage bond when you spend about four minutes a day together. I mean, four real minutes today. That's just, it's just not enough time. Let me give you another statistic before we move on. In the United States, 50% of our marriages end in divorce. We know that if you marry a second time, 67% of second marriages end in divorce, and it only gets worse if you marry more. Third marriages end approximately 74% of the time, and some of these people are Christians. And again, we really should spend more time talking about biblically healthy marriages. They are needed to, pr to prevent what God hates. Listen to Malachi 2.16. For the Lord, the God of Israel, saith that he hateth putting away. For one covereth violence, that word is sin, with his garment, saith the Lord of hosts. Therefore, take heed to your spirit that ye deal not treacherously. When two people marry, when they make a covenant, to God with their spouse. Divorce is never the intended outcome. And yet, as I've already mentioned, at least 50% of marriages, that is the outcome. And so when this happens, we know that it is always due in some part or some way to a biblically unhealthy 
marriage. And so this morning what I'm going to do is I'm going to really look at just a couple of topics uh, and review some important scriptural requirements for biblically healthy marriages. We're going to start off with one of the, one of the biggest issues. We're going to talk about legitimate versus illegitimate marriages. Now, you wouldn't really think we have to start with that, but in my dealing with the majority of people around me, this is something the majority of people do not understand. We're talking about even those who are Christians, those who should know better, but really do not even know what constitutes a legitimate marriage as opposed to an illegitimate marriage. So let's start off by making this very broad statement. There is such thing as, as unlawful or unauthorized marriages. And we'll begin to break that down a little bit more here. The sad part is, as many people in the world do not be, want to be reminded of this, and what's even more sad is, as many of us as Christians feel worried about telling somebody what constitutes a lawful or an unlawful marriage. Many of us have been in that position where we have friends and we have family members who are married to people that they ought not to be married to, and yet it's a topic we really don't want to talk about. Guys, this isn't anything different than the first century. Listen to Mark 6, 17 through 18. For Herod himself had sent forth and laid hold upon John. This is John the Immerser. Many call him John the Baptizer. And bound him in prison for Herodias' sake, his, his, brother's, his brother Philip's wife. Now notice this isn't even his wife. This is his brother's wife, although he's married to her. For he had married her. For John had said unto Herod, It is not lawful for thee to have thy brother's wife. Can you imagine if somebody threw you into prison for telling somebody they were in an unscriptural marriage? Well, he didn't take very kind to it, so he puts John the Immerser in prison because he simply told him that his marriage was unlawful. Now, if you go back and spend a little bit of time researching this, here's what you're going to find. According to history, we know that Herodias had left her husband Philip without scriptural reason. We also know that Herod was divorced. I don't know I don't know the purpose behind his divorce, but I'm going to assume that it was for the same. But neither here nor there, based off of what Herodias had done, we know that her marriage to Herod was not legitimate according to the Scriptures. Okay, And that's simply what John had told them. And so she's in an adulterous relationship. Now, Moses had stated by inspiration to the Jews, notice Deuteronomy 24.1, When a man hath taken a wife and married her, and it come to pass that she find no favor in his eyes. Let me pause for a second because there's a comma here, comma here. What is the unfavor that she has found in his eyes? He gives us this information. Because he hath found some uncleanness in her, then let him write her a bill of divorcement and give it in her hand and send her out of his house. Now what is, what is Moses teaching here by inspiration to the Jews? Let me remind you, we don't live under the old law anymore. We don't live under the law of Moses. We live under the New Testament. But here in the, in the old law, the law of Moses, which applied to the Jews, he says that if your wife has found no favor in your eyes because of uncleanness. Now, it's, an important, it's important that we have an understanding of what this uncleanness is. This uncleanness is the word nakedness. Okay? This was understood by the Pharisees to indicate a spouse who had defiled the marriage because of her nakedness. Clearly, he is, Moses is talking about adultery taking place within the marriage. That's the uncleanness he's talking about. This would allow the Jew to put her away and give her an official uh, document of divorce, which would end the marriage. Okay? So he is putting her away because of her adultery, her fornication. Jesus understood that, and Jesus taught the exact same thing. Notice Matthew 5.32. But I say unto you that whosoever shall put away his wife, saving for the cause of fornication, causeth her to commit adultery. And whosoever shall marry her that is divorced, committeth adultery. Now this occurs all too common today. I think like Herodias, you have the majority of people today who divorce their spouses for every cause, but we can learn a little bit more as we go back, and we're going to go over to Matthew 19 and look at the words of Jesus as he, as he re-emphasizes what Moses had already taught under the law of Moses. Now, this applies to us as Christians today because this is part of our New Testament. So let's follow along. I'm going to point out a few words here as we follow along in Matthew 19, starting in verse 3. The Pharisees also came unto him, 
tempting him and saying unto him, Is it lawful for a man to put away his wife for every cause? Now let me pause for a second. Here's the Jews asking him this question. I think Moses has already addressed this, hasn't he? We've already read by inspiration what Moses says the cause can be. And he answered and said unto them, Have ye not read that he which made them at the beginning made them male and female? And said, For this cause shall man leave father and mother, and shall cleave to his wife, and they twain shall be one flesh. Wherefore they are no more twain, or two, but one flesh. What therefore God hath joined together, let not man put asunder. Let me pause for a minute. Remember we noticed earlier that they are glued together. They are adhered together. That's what this uh, being yoked together in marriage is. And he says, don't let man put this asunder. The word is karitzo. That word there is divorce. No man, not myself, not even our legal system, has the right to end a marriage. The only one who can authorize divorce is God. And He has done that within His teachings. Let's continue on. Verse 7. They say unto Him, Why did Moses then command to give a writing of divorcement and to put her away? He saith unto them, Moses, because of the hardness of your hearts, suffered you to put away your wives. But from the beginning it was not so. He's referring back to Genesis 2.24, which he had already done previously. He goes on. And I say unto you, whosoever shall put away, that word there is apaluo, it means to dismiss or to loose or to send away. Whosoever shall put away his wife, except it be for fornication, I'm going to touch on that word here in a minute, and shall marry another committeth adultery. And whoso marrieth her which is put away doth commit adultery. All right, Jesus very clearly teaches us here the only reason that a spouse may, may put away their spouse and remarry is for the reason of fornication. We're talking about adultery. Here's the sad part. According to the statistics I looked up this week, between 60 and 80% of all marriages today which end, end for a reason other than fornication. 60 to 80% of marriages that are being dissolved right now are being dissolved contrary to what the Scriptures teach. Let that sink in for just a second. Jesus says over in Matthew 19, 9, let's go back and let me point out just a couple more words. Whosoever shall put away his wife except it be for fornication. I had a conversation last week or the week before and the person didn't know what this word meant. Because of our audience, I'm going to be very careful in how I describe it and what I say. As a matter of fact, the entire sermon I'm going to have to do that. But that word fornication is the Greek word pornea. Without going into great detail, any act which includes the genitalia of a member in which you are not married to is pornea. That should really simplify what fornication is, right? If you're not married to them and it involves the genitalia, that is fornication, okay? Let's go on. Whosoever shall put, his way, put away his wife except for fornication, I described what that is, and shall marry another committeth adultery, and whoso marrieth her which is put away doth commit adultery. Let me focus in on the word adultery here for just a minute. That word there is moikeo. That word simply means unlawful sexual acts. Okay, Anybody who puts away their wife except for fornication commits unlawful sexual acts. That's what they're going to do with the person whom they marry. He goes on, and whoso marrieth her, the one who is put away, the one that did commit adultery, they commit adultery. Again, unlawful sexual acts. What's he trying to say here? Jesus is showing us first this law applies to everyone. He says whosoever. That whether you're a Christian or whether you're not a Christian, this is a universal law. It's a law that has been in place from the very beginning. Remember, Jesus went back to Genesis 2.24 it existed all throughout the Old Testament, according for the Jew, as we saw Moses taught by inspiration, and it still is in alignment or applicable to everyone today. Here's the point. Any person who puts away their spouse for a reason other than fornication and marries another person is committing adultery. As we've already shown, that is unlawful sexual acts with whoever they marry. And any person who marries the one who is put away is committing adultery. The only exception which Moses gave and which Jesus reaffirms is if a person is put away for the grounds of fornication, pornea, we described what that word is, 
in which case only the innocent spouse would be able to remarry. Here's the basic idea that Jesus is trying to get across. If you divorce your spouse for any reason other than fornication, you have really done nothing other than commit adultery. And no real, no real divorce has ever occurred because it was never authorized by God in the first place. You can say you divorce your spouse. You can even go down to the courthouse and file legal papers and divorce your spouse legally. But because it didn't meet the requirements of what God says, no divorce has ever actually taken place. God still holds you accountable as being married to that first spouse. It doesn't matter what the piece of paper says. Doesn't even matter what you say. You're still married to that first spouse. That's why he says you're committing adultery or you're involved in these unlawful acts of intimacy. I'll try to use that word as much as I can because the other one is kind of harsh on the ears. So God still holds you accountable and still married to this first spouse if you put them away for a reason other than fornication. Now, the state may recognize your divorce, but that doesn't mean that God does. Let me make it very easy for anyone who's here, and I try to normally do this. The only people who can legitimately marry are those who have never been married, those who have had a spouse die, or those who have had a spouse who was unfaithful, they put them away, and then they were eligible to marry another faithful Christian. That's as simple as we can put it. Now, why do I have to say all that? This is the basis to determine whether a marriage is legitimate or illegitimate. The rest of the sermon doesn't even really mean anything if your marriage isn't legitimate in the first place. Now let's move on to the next topic as we talk about getting an understanding of biblically healthy marriages. Let's talk about steadfast love. I'm not talking about the infatuation that many of us had when we were younger or the feelings of love that we had when we first were infatuated with the person that we were spending time with. I'm talking about loving our spouse in the way that we're told to love them because we've made a covenant with God and with them. And so that's a love that is based on role, it's based on responsibility, and it is based on uh, the work that we as a spouse need to carry out on behalf of the relationship. And we're talking about doing all of this with the mindset that I'm going to be committed until I die. I don't think most people really get that when they get married. I don't think they understand it. It is something that can be learned. It can be taught and it can be cultivated. We as, as husbands, let's talk with the husbands first here. And, and let me say there, I really wish I could spend more time on each of these topics. Each of these probably is a sermon in and of themselves. Let me start off by talking about the husband for just a few minutes. And I will say that for some people who may be watching this online who've not heard this, uh, some of these things may be... They may be deemed old-fashioned, and I'll, I'll mention that. Let's talk about husbands here for just a few minutes because we can learn to love our wives the way the Bible tells us to love our wives. I'm going to go over to Ephesians 5.25. It says, Husbands, love your wives. You ever wonder if you're loving your wife correctly? How do you do it? He says, Even as Christ also loved the church and gave Himself for it. That's a pretty high standard for love if you begin to think about it. If you want to know how to love your wife, you simply need to go back and you need to understand what it, what it is and how much it is that Jesus loved and sacrificed Himself on behalf of the church. Right? We're talking about a purely devoted and sacrificial love. Colossians 3.19 says, Husbands, love your wives and be not bitter against them. Now certainly this has never happened in any of our marriages, right? Any of you guys had bitterness take place. You may wonder what that word actually means there. The word bitter there, pecrano, means to have resentment or hatred towards somebody, to exasperate or to become angry or to grieve. Now certainly that has never happened in any marriage that is uh, here, right? None of us have ever had that take place. And we wouldn't want it to because the whole purpose uh, for husbands is to strengthen the marriage bond, not to grieve it, not to deteriorate it, through anger and strife and resentment and bitterness. And I think we get that logically. I get it logically. But I have to tell you guys, at times I've failed here. And my guess is there are other husbands here who'd be willing to admit the same thing. And for many of us, it takes time for us to learn this. I didn't, I didn't understand this when I got married. I didn't understand how to carry it out. I still don't carry it out perfect. I'm much better than I was. 
but I am nowhere near the standard that is given to me as a husband in loving my wife. Now let's talk about wives for just a minute in loving their husbands. <clears throat> I'm going to go over to Titus 2. We'll read verses 4 through 5. This is, might, might be where some ears start to perk up, and I'll have to mention a few things. Titus 2, verses 4 through 5. It says that they may teach the young women to be sober, to love their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet, chaste, keepers at home, good, obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God be not blasphemed. I think an awful lot of people make the mistake that love is just feelings, right? And I think it goes back to that statement where you hear someone say, I'm falling out of love with my spouse. They have a very incorrect idea of what love really is. Biblical love is accompanied and demonstrated through our actions. Listen to 1 John 3, 18 and 19. My little children, let us not love in word, neither in tongue, but in deed and in truth. And hereby we, we know that we are of the truth and shall assure our hearts before Him. The truth of the matter is, is that our marriages are strengthened by our actions toward our spouse, which are based on love. And then in turn, our love is strengthened because we see the evidence of our, of our, our spouse's love towards us. How many of you guys have ever had a spouse do something for you just simply to do it for you? Once in a while, my wife will bring home black licorice. I'm not supposed to eat it, really, on my keto diet. But once in a while, she brings home black licorice for no reason other than I like black licorice. And I didn't even ask for it. And I think, man, she must really love me to bring me black licorice. <laughs> Sometimes we do things for our spouses, not because we have to. We just want them to know that we love them, right? That's one of the ways as, as Christians that we help strengthen the marriage bond, to have a biblically healthy marriage. Now, with that being said, we also then have to recall that there are biblical roles for the husband and the wife. Let me start off by saying, and I think it's pretty apparent if you watch TV, that the Bible and society have always been at odds regarding the roles of husbands and wives. And the world today has really attacked God's prescribed roles for the husband and the wife. I'm going to go over to Ephesians chapter 5. I'm going to look at verses 22 through 24. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church. For he is the Savior of the body. And therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ... So let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. This is where some ears might perk up and people may disagree. The husband is the leader of the, of the marriage. It's not because he's better. He's the leader because God has assigned him that role. And I would suggest that the majority of us, when we got married, we had no idea how to lead our marriages. It's something that we oftentimes we learn over time. And whether I'm shy or whether I do not feel prepared, it does not matter because God has assigned me the role as being the leader over the marriage. Now, that doesn't mean that my wife has no voice. Uh, I appreciate my wife and I appreciate her values. And because she has a totally different perspective, and guys, let's admit, we don't think like our wives. And oftentimes our wives think and see things that we never see from our, I'll call it our masculine perspective. And oftentimes we make rash decisions, right? And so we value the different perspective that our wife has, and we weigh all that into account with a, a number of other variables, and we take all of that into consideration when we're making decisions on behalf of the family. There have been a lot of times where I have thought it was appropriate to do something, and my wife said, have you ever considered? And I had not. And I realized that as the leader of the family, if I'd have made that choice, I would have made, an in, I would have made probably an inappropriate or a wrong course of action. And so this has nothing to do with equality. We're talking about biblical roles as assigned by God. And so whether I feel prepared or whether I feel shy or whether I feel inferior, I am the leader. I have to be. That's what I have been instructed. With that being said, the husband's also to provide for his family. But I have to touch and say this because I have actually listened to a number of people who have, and I always hate to do this, I've heard, of, I've heard a number of people who've actually taught where it is sinful for a female to work outside the home. Let me address it this way and then I'll address it a different way. That's not what you find in the Old Testament when you go back and you look, for example, at Proverbs 
31 of the virtuous wife, she worked outside the home and inside the home. And it's not what we find in the New Testament uh, when we talk about the standard for providing for our home. Am I saying it's always the best option? I'm not saying that either. And, and there's a number of things we really need to consider. It should be a, probably a whole other sermon. But go on over to 1 Timothy 5a. And there's some other passages I could use, but I'm going to use this one to help get some understanding. 1 Timothy 5.8, it says, But if any, and I'm going to focus on that word any here for a minute, but if any provide not for his own, let me go back and say this, in both the Greek and the English, we have an understanding that when something is gender neutral, the proper way of writing is always to use masculine form. They're getting away from that today. You'll oftentimes find people now where they're actually having you write he slash she, that's not how it used to be done. Everything was, if you were using a gender-neutral sentence, you wrote he, okay? Well, they're getting away from that. But that is how the Greek is written, and that's how English used to be written. But if any provide not for his own, and especially for those of his own house, he hath denied the faith and is worse than an infidel. Now, I'm not going to go down. I didn't even write the verse down. I think it's, uh, if you follow on down to verse 16, he talks about a believer there. Uh, and we're talking about both males and females, and we find it in a number of places. But this word any here is the Greek word tis. The dictionary defines it as being nominative, singular, masculine, and or feminine. And here's the idea, along with other scripture that I'm not going to give. Both spouses can, provi- uh, can, can take part in providing for the family. As the leader of the family, I am ultimately responsible for my family. That, that rests on my shoulders. Can a wife and a husband both work outside the home? They can both do that. Am I suggesting that's the best course of action? I'm not suggesting that. And as a matter of fact, if you go back, really starting in about the 60s, other than from history we know World War II, what you commonly found for the average household was you had the husband working outside the home and you had the, the wife working inside the home and taking care of the children. Now, a lot of people are going to hear me say that, and they're going to say, this is sexist and it is, it is outdated. Guys, I'm going to tell you, I don't believe that for just a second. And here's the reason I don't believe that. And again, let me go back and reemphasize. If a, woman, if a wife needs to work outside the home, they're, they're not having enough income. She may need to do that. But the idea of me saying that may not be the best method or prescribed method, it's not sexist and it's not outdated. In my secular workplace, I speak with a number of women who are working outside the home, not because they want to, but because they have to. As a matter of fact, this week on third shift, when I went in, I usually get in before third shift leaves, and there's a certain lady that uh, occasionally when I'll come by and ask her how she's doing, she's, if I had to guess, she's 26, 27, and she always looks very tired. She works third shift, guys, so that she can go home and take care of her children during the day. She has some little ones at home, right? Her husband works and she works. And I asked her on Friday morning, I said, you look tired this morning. And she said, well, I haven't slept in two days other than I took a nap for an hour or two, but it's hard to watch the children when I'm taking a nap. And she said, you know, I, I really wish I didn't have to work a secular job to provide for my family. And yet she's finding herself in a position where she has to work. They cannot they, they are unable, I don't know what the reasons are, but they're unable to get by without two, two sources of income. I've had a number of women tell me they wish they could stay home and that they could just take care of their families and take care of the house. Why is it that some may feel that way? Well, let's go on over to Titus 2, 3 through 5, as we learn the wife is the keeper of the home. Titus 2, starting in verse 3, The aged women likewise, that they be in behavior as becometh holiness, not false accusers, not given to much wine, teachers of good things, that they may teach the young women to be sober, to love their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet, chaste, keepers, that word actually is workers, workers at home, good, obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God be not blasphemed. I've had women ask me if my wife works. And I said, that well, my wife works out of the house. She stays home and works during the day. And I've had a number of women say, I really, wish I, could, I really wish I could do that. So for anybody who's watching this who thinks that the idea of a wife staying at home, as we'll call them stay-at-home mothers, is sexist or that it's old-fashioned, for many women, that's exactly what they want. Am I saying there are times when they may not be able to do that? Yeah. I also know of an account where there are people who do not want to stay home, and it's because they, they don't like staying around their children all day. 
I've literally, I literally have heard people say, I can't stand to be home all day around my kids. So that's why I work. I'll touch on that here in a minute. But it's not sexist to, stay that, to say that uh, women uh, can't, or that women shouldn't be out working, and I'm not saying that. It's not sexist to say that, that women should have their place in the home. Sometimes we understand it's financially needed, but the Bible teaches very clearly that the, that the home is the wife's domain. Again, there's a very big difference between men and women. Uh, how many of you guys would like to live in a house that had 15 guys living in it and no women? You guys ever seen what a bachelor pad looks like? The home is the wife's domain. The reason our homes oftentimes are appealing to us is because they don't have a masculine touch. They have a feminine touch to it. It feels like home. It feels like a place of warmth. Let me tell you something here. 70% of women with children under the age of 18 today work. 70% of women with children under the age of 18 work. That means children are being shoveled off and they're being raised by people who are not their parents. And they're being taught things that may not be the beliefs of their parents. Uh, and they're, they're, in often, they're oftentimes being influenced in unscriptural ways. And what I mean is, is as Christians, if this number applies to Christians, which it, it may not, but if 70% of Christians were sending their children off to other places, think about this, for the most part, you've got non-Christians raising your children. And I've already mentioned how much time it is that spouses spend together. But guys, it's, it's just as bad for our children. I know that outside the church, many people devalue what we call stay-at-home mothers. How many of you guys have ever heard the jokes, right? She stays home all day and she eats bonbons. How many of you guys have heard that, right? She doesn't really work from home. She stays at home, she takes it easy, and she eats, she eats bonbons. You know what studies don't show you? There are a number of studies that show an increase in educational performance when there is at least one stay-at-home parent. The studies also, people don't like to mention, that children who are raised in a home with at least one parent at home have decreased stress and aggression. And here's a very sad fact. According to a recent poll that I looked up this week, and, I, and again, it's probably correct. Parents spend, on average, 34 minutes of uninterrupted time with their children a day. 34 minutes. And that's not hard to, uh, that's not hard to believe when you find out that 70% of people are sending their children to be raised by other people, right? You think about a home where both parents are working, and by the time they get home, let's say it's 5 o'clock, the kids get home from school, if we're in school, uh, and by the time you make dinner, and by the time you sit and relax and, and do whatever, you literally have 34 minutes a day with your children. This is a whole other sermon, but you wonder why children are leaving the church. Many children have no idea how it is to even be a Christian because they only spend 34 minutes a day with their Christian parents. Here's another sad fact that goes back to the eating bonbons thing. Of the stay-at-home mothers that were polled in the study that I went back and researched, 42% of stay-at-home mothers said they felt like they were struggling in their work as a stay-at-home mother. Why? Because it's work. Because it's work. Running the children, getting the prescriptions, cleaning the house, doing all the stuff that needs to be done while the spouse is out doing other work. And if it's a stay-at-home husband, which I know of accounts where the husband stays at home and the wife works because she makes more money, it's the same thing for him taking care of the children, running all of the errands, doing the shopping, doing the clothes, whatever the stuff needs to be done during the day when they have time because they're the ones that are at the house working and taking care of the house. And 42% of stay-at-home mothers said they are struggling in keeping up with their workload. Let me talk about one more topic. Uh, and this is one that's always difficult to talk about, but it needs to be. And let me say this, I look up a lot of polls as I worked on this, of course, obviously I'm going to use scripture, but I looked up a lot of polls as I studied on this, and I thought back to when I was taking my, my master's in counseling. I'm not going to give you a lot of the results of the polls that I studied this week, and the reason is, is I really can't because it's going to make people feel uncomfortable. So I really cannot do it. Uh, but with that being said, many people, including Christians, have wrong ideas regarding intimacy in marriage. Again, this is another entire sermon, but I'm going to just cover it in a few different areas. Let's go on over to 1 Corinthians chapter 7. We'll look at verses 1 through 5, and again, I'm always trying to be careful with my language. 
but I always want to describe it as best as I can. And let me say this before I even get into this. When we talk about intimacy in marriage, I want to make a point for, especially for our younger people here. When we talk about intimacy, anytime it is related to something outside the marriage bond, it is always, always, always negative. But when we talk about intimacy within the marriage, we need to always have a positive mindset. And that is because many people are carrying around a lot of baggage because of the incorrect things they have been taught or that they have assumed. And so let's begin to get a better understanding. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, starting in verse 1, Paul writes to the church in Corinth, Now concerning the things whereof ye wrote unto me, it is good for a man not to touch a woman. Let me pause. You don't have to, you don't have to be married if you're a Christian. But if you're going to be a faithful Christian, there's some things you need to know. And he goes on. Nevertheless, to avoid fornication, that's that word pornea. Remember, I already described what that was, any of those acts involving the genitalia of a, of a uh, person you're not married to. Nevertheless, to avoid that, let every man have his own wife, and let every woman have her own husband. Let the husband render unto the wife due benevolence, and likewise also the wife unto the husband. The wife hath not power of her own body, but the husband. And likewise also the husband hath not power of his own body, but the wife. Defraud ye not one the other. That word means to, uh, to hold back or to withhold. He says, Do not withhold yourself, except it be for consent for time, that ye may give yourself to fasting and prayer, and come together again that Satan tempt you not for your incontinence. That is a lack of restraint. Right? There's a time of withholding. He gives the purpose why. But then he says, come back together because there's a possibility you may have a lack of restraint. What's Paul teaching? Paul is teaching here very clearly that there is regular intimacy as part of the marriage bond. He uses the phrase here, render due benevolence. He is talking about physical intimacy within the marriage. And he makes it very clear that both spouses' bodies belong to the other spouse. Right? What he's trying to get us to understand is, is each of us as spouses are responsible to fulfill the intimate needs of the other spouse. There are a lot of individuals and marriages which have become plagued with the idea that the intimate acts within the marriage bond are shameful, that they are dirty. And as I listened to the conversation of the ladies at work who didn't know I was even listening to them, would even go so far as to say they are burdensome. Just something that you do, right, to appease your spouse. Listen to Hebrews 13, 4. Marriage is honorable in all, and the bed undefiled, but whoremongers and adulterers God will judge. All right, marriage is honorable in all, and the bed undefiled. The word bed there is coite. It's where we get our word coitus from. I'm not going to go any further than that. But he says that act within the marriage bond, that's unsoiled. Those acts are pure as opposed to that word pornea, which we learned those things are not pure. So what's he teaching? The intimate acts within the marriage bond are pure, but outside the marriage bond, as we've already learned from the word pornea there, all of those acts, they are worthy of the judgment of God. So what's he saying? Intimacy within marriage, it's great and it's wonderful. Intimacy outside of the marriage bond, it is detestable and you are going to face the judgment of God. You're going to face wrath for what it is you've done. Now, I don't know if there's anybody here that believes this, but I have heard, and, and actually you'll find this quite a bit, uh, oftentimes even maybe with some more of the Baptist denominational groups, but you'll find that some teach that intimacy in marriage is only for procreation. Many of them, I think, come to this conclusion when you go over and you read Genesis 1.28. They take out the context of what's going on here, but Genesis 1.28 and God blessed them, and God said unto them, Be fruitful, and multiply, and replenish the earth. Right? That verse has led many people to think that intimacy in marriage is only for, only for the purpose of, of procreation. Another reason that many people have come to that conclusion is because, again, as I told you, many people carry the baggage around that, that intimacy is dirty and it is shameful. Let me say this, intimacy within marriage has two different aspects. One of those is strengthening the marriage bond. The second one is producing children. Now, if you go back 
uh, and spend some time reading the Song of Solomon, you're going to realize that that book describes the enjoyment and the pleasure of intimacy between spouses. Uh, and other than when I read it this morning, and actually I thought John was going to read it, and I said, hey, I gave him the passage. I said, that's the one verse you're allowed to read out of, out of Song of Solomon because the rest of them you can't. You know why we don't quote out of Song of Solomon? It is describing in detail the physical intimate acts between spouses in great detail. If you've never read Song of Solomon, go back and read Song of Solomon. When was the last time you guys ever heard someone quote from Song of Solomon in a sermon? You know why we don't do it? Because it makes people uncomfortable. But I'll tell you this, if you go back and read Song of Solomon, you're not going to find that that book was written as a one time we're married and now this is for procre or just for procreation. That's all it is. And I'm a little hesitant to even read this verse, but I'm going to. I'm going to actually read from the Proverbs writer. This is, there's a lot of verses I could read. This one I thought I could get away with. I still feel a little uncomfortable, but I'm going to do it. Notice Proverbs 5, 18 through 19. Is I, I'm just simply trying to dispel the idea that many people teach that intimacy in marriage is only for procreation. And that's taught by a number of people. Proverbs 5, starting in verse 18 through 19. Let thy fountain be blessed and rejoice with the wife of thy youth. Let her be as the loving hind and pleasant roe. Let her breasts satisfy thee at all times and be thou ravished always with her love. Why did I read that? Guys, that is a far cry from the idea of intimacy only for the purpose of procreation. What's he describing? He is describing a marriage in which the spouses are, are intimately desirous of one another. And that's exactly what you find in the book Song of Solomon. 42% of people who were polled, and these are people that attend a church, stated that they wish their minister would speak more about intimacy within marriage. Of those who were polled, 26% said that this topic is only addressed one time or less per year. Why? You guys know why. It is uncomfortable. It is, a, it is as uncomfortable for me to try to give it using proper language and still being descriptive as it is for you to hear it. And the polls state that churches in general are not teaching on this topic. And I would go so far as to say many churches of Christ are not teaching on this topic. Why? It is uncomfortable. What are we learning from the polls? We are learning that people are not talking about marriage and intimacy issues from the pulpit. They're not talking about it in classes, or they're not talking about it in special classes for those who are going to be married or for those who are already married. And I have to say that I agree that there are a number of things that you can't talk about really in a mixed setting. Uh, you really have to kind of have a specific group sometimes to deal with some of those things. But here's what I know. I know that we have to be talking about this. And because we are not, 37% of the spouses who were polled stated they were dissatisfied with the intimacy in their marriage. Now, I looked at a number of the polls and, and looked at the reasons why, and I can't, I can't go back and give those really within a sermon, but I can tell you this, and guys, that's, that's, a, that's a very large number. Can you imagine 37% of spouses are not happy with intimacy within their marriage? How good do you think a marriage is when one of the spouses is not happy? It wasn't just intimacy. There were a number of things they were unhappy about. And, and as I read the polls, in a number of these sections where it talked about dissatisfaction within marriage, one of the polls was, have you spoken to your spouse about these areas in which you are dissatisfied? Guess what the answer was for the majority of them? We don't talk about it with our spouse when we're dissatisfied, whether it's in other areas or even intimacy, because you know why? It's uncomfortable. It's the same reason we oftentimes don't even talk about this type of stuff from the pulpit. And yet we find that almost 40% of spouses were dissatisfied in their marriages. We need to be talking about the difficult topics, the uncomfortable topics. We need to be asking the questions of those things that even though we feel are uncomfortable need to be asked. I have had people ask me questions that they were extremely embarrassed to ask. I didn't feel any embarrassment in answering the question. It's a biblical question. It probably should be asked. And if you don't know, you need to ask. As Christians, we need to be asking the hard questions, and we do need to be teaching on the uncomfortable topics. 
As Christians, we ought to have the best marriages of everybody that is out there. But here's the reason we don't. Many lack legitimacy. We talked about that. Some marriages just aren't legitimate. They don't just lack legitimacy. Many of them literally lack lasting love. How many of you know somebody who would say they're in a loveless marriage? They don't just lack love. We know that many of them actually lack the proper roles of the spouses. And guys, even, even more sad is, is all of this plays out and it carries out into the very fact that many of them even lack the intimacy necessary for building a strong marriage. And guys, let me say this. When a marriage is dysfunctional, that last area where it normally shows up is the intimacy within the marriage. If your marriage is, is a marriage that does not have intimacy, there's problems somewhere else. And that's a, whole nother, that's a whole nother sermon to talk about. But as we draw this to a close, let me say this. Since our marriages are representative of Christ in the church, then we need to focus for just a minute on man's responsibility to Christ and the church. And it's not a very complicated thing to understand. All, all men are responsible to understanding and obeying the gospel. Let's just start there. And as you read through primarily Acts, you will learn about the conversion accounts who had an understanding of what the gospel taught and what they needed to do. There were people teaching the gospel. That's how faith comes, by hearing, Romans 10, 17. They came to the understanding that Jesus Christ was our Messiah, and they believed that. They had faith, uh, Hebrews eleven six 6 and John eight twenty four. They understood the consequence of sin in their life. They knew they had sinned, Romans 3.23, and they knew the consequence was death, Romans 6.23, and so they understood they needed to repent, which is what Jesus taught. In Luke 13.3 and 5, Paul also taught it in Acts 17.30. They also were willing to confess Christ, Romans 10, 9 and 10, and then they were willing to be baptized by immersion for the remission of sins, Mark 16.16 16 and Acts 2.38. That's how one gets into Christ, Galatians 3, 26 and 27, through this reenactment of a death, burial, and resurrection in water, Romans 6, 3, and 4, because that's what adds you to the church. The Lord will add you to the church when you've obeyed the gospel, Acts 2, verse 47. That's the very first part, man's understanding of the gospel. Here's the hard part. We then have to be a faithful Christian. There's so much there, we could preach every week on it and still never cover it all, right? There's a lot that is expected of us as Christians. But for us as Christians, that really ultimately starts if we're married within the home and our children. I hope that as we've looked at this, and it's been brief, and I've only been able to barely touch the surface, I hope you've got an understanding a little bit better of what is a biblically healthy marriage. And as I draw this to a close, let each of us look back throughout the week. Look at your life, how you've lived as a Christian. And if you're married, ask yourself, have you been faithful? If you're not married, again, ask yourself the same question. Are you preparing for a, few, uh, for a marriage in the future? As I draw this to a close, if you're here, if you're not a baptized believer, we would love to assist you in teaching you the gospel and helping you to be added to the church. If you are here and you're a Christian, if you're struggling in some way, uh, we'd be willing to assist. We could offer prayers on your behalf. But in either situation, you can come forward as we're led in a song of invitation.